have your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 15. We are in a series called Revival. Somebody say Revival. Today, I want to talk to you about being ready for revival. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready? Ready for revival, 2 Chronicles chapter 15. As you're turning there, I thought this would be a great way to introduce this topic today. Many of you know that I'm from the Midwest, okay? I was born in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, in the boot heel of southeast Missouri. I was raised in a small town called Fredericktown. Uh, but it was about an hour and a half south of St. Louis. And so I am a huge St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan. Are there any, any Redbirds among us? Okay, these are my people. I didn't know anything about football until I moved to Baton Rouge, but I've been a diehard Cardinal baseball fan since I can remember. And so uh, when Trevor was young, we would every summer would go up to St. Louis And I would take him to visit the ballpark, and we would spend a couple of days, and we would take in a Cardinals game. And it was a a chance for me to relive my childhood. Plus, I got to raise that boy right. Got to put the right values in him, because everybody knows that God's favorite baseball team is the St. Louis Cardinals. (laughs) If you don't believe that, we've got ushers that are going to escort you right out the build. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. And so I remember, I think it was one of our first trips to St. Louis, and Trevor was taking it all in. We had spent the day at the Ballpark Village and, and went to the, the Cardinals Hall of Fame, and we took all the pictures, and we just, we, we lived the experience. The game was that night, and so we had great seats. You know, our whole goal was to get a foul ball. You know, when you go to your first baseball game, you want to get a baseball. And so we had perfect seats. We were on the third baseline which is kind of where foul ball territory is, about 15, 20 rows up. I don't even remember who they were playing, but the seats were amazing. And, man, I was like in baseball heaven. I'm like, Trevor, isn't this amazing? This is a little bit what heaven's going to look like when we get there. So about the fifth inning, Trevor turns to me and says, Dad, I got to use the bathroom. Middle of the game, middle of the game. Dad, I got to use the bathroom. No, no, son, look, we're going to wait in between innings to use the bathroom. He said, Dad, I got to go now. Come on, parents, how many of you know what's an emergency? You got to roll. So we're like, okay, excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. So we reached the end of the row, and we kind of ran down the aisle. Okay, hurry, hurry, son. Okay, in the bathroom. Hurry, son, are you good? You good? Okay, great. Let's Wait, did you wash your hands? Wash your hands, boy. Mama's going to fuss at both of us if you don't wash your hands. Okay, great. So he finished using the bathroom, washed his hands, and we rolled back. And, man, getting back, excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me. We sat back down in our seats, and everybody around was kind of looking at us. I was like, what? What, what? what just happened? He said, well, while you and your son were in the bathroom, a foul ball came screaming off of the bat and landed right in your son's basket of French fries. <laughs> true story. Come on, baby. Am I lying? If I'm lying, I'm frying. This is the true story. Landed, and sure enough, his French fries were everywhere. The, the basket of fries was nowhere to be found, but the mess of fries was everywhere. And I'm like, well, well, where's the ball? Little boy behind us had the ball. I said, can I see that ball? <laughs> Son, look. He's like, Dad, that's my ball. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> it was your ball. But you were out of position. Mm, 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 mm. Come on, you know where I'm going with this story. You see, I believe God wants to give you some things this year. But you got to be in position. You got to be where you're supposed to be because God has a blessing. He's got an anointing. He has an experience. He has something for you this year with your name on it but you got to be where you're supposed to be. You know, when we talk about revival, I believe God's word to us as a church is, hey, I am doing something in the earth today, and I don't want you to miss it. My prayer for healing place is that we would be in position. Somebody say position. Be where we're supposed to be. Do what we're supposed to do. There are many things that can move us out of position, that can displace us, and yet God's trying to get something to you, but you're supposed to be where he wants you to be. 
Now, when it comes to revival, we can't manufacture revival. We don't obligate God to do what we declare that he should do. How many of you know you can't force God's hand? Uh, you know what? Why are we praying? Why are we fasting? Why are we declaring these nights of revival? It's not to force God's hand. It's to prepare our hearts. We can't manufacture revival, but we can position ourselves to receive everything that God wants to give us. Can I have a good amen? You see, the heartbeat of this text today is about positioning you individually and us as a church to receive God's best. In 2 Chronicles chapter 15, uh, this is the, the story of King Asa. If you were here last week, we, we talked about King Solomon and his revival whenever he built the temple of the Lord and as they dedicated the temple of God. This, in the time of ancient Israel, in their history, happens under King Asa. Now, Asa is taking over for his dad, King Abijah. And man, say that five times. Uh, but this, his dad was a wicked king. His dad, he didn't honor God. He didn't fear the Lord. Man, he lived selfishly and recklessly. He took advantage of the people. But then King Asa, his son, comes into power, and he does something different. Let me stop right here and say this. You can't do anything about your ancestors, but you can do something about your descendants. Maybe some of you inherited a bad set of circumstances. Maybe there's been something generational that's been broken and dysfunctional in your family for as long as you can remember. You can't do anything about that, but you don't have to repeat what's coming down the pipe. You can make a decision that, hey, this is the generation that's going to break all of that. King Asa steps into power. Now, the Bible tells us that there was civil war between the northern and the southern kingdoms. They, they begin to worship foreign gods. They, they didn't recognize the one true living God. There was strife and violence. There was idolatry. The house of God was neglected. Does this sound familiar? Here I'm describing ancient Israel and the division and strife and animosity, the godlessness that had crept into their culture, uh, the, the house of God that was neglected. It kind of sounds very similar to what's happening in the earth today. Pick up the story with me, 2 Chronicles chapter 15, starting with verse 3. The Bible says this, For a long time Israel was without the true God. They were without a priest to teach them. They were without the law to instruct them. But whenever they were in trouble and turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him out, they found him. During those dark times, somebody say dark times. During those dark times, it was not safe to travel. Problems troubled the people of every land. Nation fought against nation, and city fought against city, for God was troubling them with every kind of of problem. Now, one of the things you're going to recognize when you do a study of biblical revivals, there are certain common denominators, and the first thing that they all have in common is this. Number one, it starts with dark times. Dark times, difficult times, civil unrest, idolatry, a disconnection from the Lord. We see that happening in Asa's day. Because of the decisions of his father, it created darkness over the entire land. You know, as I was studying this this week, I thought, man, I would be a terrible Old Testament prophet. I'm just not good preaching gloom and doom. I'm not that kind of guy. It's hard for me to really step into that. And man, I'm kind of a happy guy. Man, I, I like to encourage people. Man, I, I like to give people hope. But the truth is, these were dark days. These were very difficult days. Now, you know, our world is in a mess. Can I have a good amen? You don't need me to stand up here on this pulpit and tell you how bad it is. You can see how bad it is. Anybody who has common sense knows that it's not getting any better. You can see how difficult, I man, you can feel the tension man, that, that's in our culture and our society. You, you can see the pervading darkness as it sweeps in across our community. Common sense will show you that. But I realize this, that we're living in a day where common sense is not so common. Have you discovered that? Is it just me or does it feel like the world has lost its mind? 
You know, the truth is when you kick God out, you invite confusion in. Can I, can I say that again? When you say, God, you're not welcome here. God, we don't want you in our community. We don't want you in our school system. We don't want you in our government. We sure don't want you telling us how to live our life. When you kick God out, you invite confusion and chaos of every kind in. And this was what was happening in the days of Asa. The scripture says in Proverbs 29, verse 2, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in power, they groan. How many of you know the nations of the world are groaning because times are dark and difficult? You can feel that groaning in, 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 in the human soul. But there is, check this out, there is an upside to difficult days. The upside is this. Darkness identifies our idols. I'm going to talk about this more in just a moment. But it also makes us desperate for God. Man, when you're in a dark season, you're desperate. And you know what? Desperation is not a bad thing. Can somebody help me preach today? You know, sometimes it takes desperation to move you into position because comfort has gotten you out of position. Sometimes, the, I heard Pastor Johnny say this years ago, and I never forgot it. He said, don't let the blessings of God take you out of the will of God. Sometimes God just starts blessing you and he's so good to you and you coast on the blessings and you move into a place where you're not even where you're supposed to be. You know what? There, there's, some, there, there's an upside to difficulty. It creates a desperation. And when you're desperate for God, you pray different prayers. When you're desperate for God, you think different thoughts. When you're desperate for God, you, you set your schedule a little differently. You do something that you've never done before because you need something you've never had before. Come on, put your hands together if you believe that. Somebody say dark times. Hey, don't be discouraged by the dark. Shine your light. You see, I'm not up here to give any credence to darkness. Man, I'm not, oh, it's so bad. I'm not trying to create fear. Don't criticize the darkness. Shine the light. You see, in the darkest of nights shines the brightest of lights. I believe that this is the day. This is the hour. Now is the time for the church to rise up in power. Now, God is looking for people who are not insulated by comfort, but maybe they have been pushed out of their comfort into desperate places. You see, desperation plus expectation equals visitation. People who were desperate for Jesus. Man, the woman with the issue of blood, come on now. She'd been bleeding for 12 years, sought the help of doctors, and didn't get any better, the Bible says. She only became worse. She heard that Jesus was coming. And the Bible says she pushed her way through that crowd. Desperation will force you to push your way through some things. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And listen, she reached out and she touched him. There were people all around him and Jesus stopped. He said, whoa, 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 wait, who touched me? And the disciples are like, Lord, are you serious? Who touched you? Look, there's a bazillion people all around you. You want to know who touched you? He says, this touch was different. You see, there's, it didn't just touch the hem of his garment, but it touched his heart, and it pulled virtue from him. You see, desperation plus expectation equals visitation. Look at what it says, 2 Chronicles 15, verse 1. Then the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. He went out to meet King Asa as he was returning from battle. He says, listen to me, Asa. He shouted, listen, all ye people of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, he will, you will find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. Now notice the dark and difficult times that the nation is in. But then the Bible says that this man named Azariah, he stepped up. Who is Azariah? Azariah was one of these little no-name prophets. 
I mean, this is kind of the, the only passage in Scripture where you read about this guy is right here. It's like as soon as he appears, he disappears. I was studying about this, and I felt here's what God dropped in my heart. Not only are these dark times and difficult days, which is the precursor for revival, but number two, leaders need to step up. Leaders need to step up and lead. You know, God has placed something inside of each and every one of us. Some of you are like, well, pastor, I, I, I'm, I'm not really a leader. I, I don't really have anything to offer. Oh, yes, you do. Do not minimize the gift of God inside of you. Sometimes by default, we've just delegated leadership to others. Well, he'll step up. Well, she'll do it. They've got the gifting. They've got the platform. I don't have that kind of anointing. I don't have that kind of capacity. And God, I'm here to lay a demand on the leadership gift inside of you today. God's placed influence in your life, uh, be it big or small. Say, so Mike, I, I can't preach. I can't sing. I don't have this gift. Listen, you have influence. How many parents do we have? How many grandparents do we have? Okay. You've got influence with your kids and with your grandkids. You want to change the world? Start at home. Start with what God has put in front of you. Some of you are like, well, pastor, I work in a dark and wicked place. Perfect. <laughs> well, God, I can't lead. I, I, my, my workplace needs revival, but they're just a bunch of wicked heathens. And God's saying, I know. That's why I have you there at that dark place to shine your light. Come on, some of, you, some of you students go to school and you're like, man, I'm the only one. I'm the only one serving God. Everybody, you know what? God placed you there for a reason, for a season, and for a soul. Come on, somebody. Leaders, step up. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to step up. Now, notice this. Personal revival begins with us. And once it starts with us, it doesn't end with us. You see, personal revival leads to corporate revival. If you look at every documented revival, both in the scriptures and throughout human history, look at the Azusa Street revival that took place 100 years ago in California. It started with one man named William Seymour from Centerville, Louisiana. Come on, somebody. God will use an old boy from South Louisiana, talk to me, bring him all the way to California, the great Azusa Street Revival, where it was marked by diversity of different ethnicities and people groups. It was full of the spirit of power, and people spoke in tongues, and then there were signs and wonders and healing, and it started with one man. Listen to me. A move of God starts with one person, but it's never accomplished by one person. You see, leaders got to step up and lead. Lead your family. Influence your workplace. Make a difference on your campus. Come on, is anybody receiving this today? You see, the truth is, you are different in order to make a difference. God's put something unique inside of you that cannot be conformed to the world around you. Have you ever wondered, man, why do I always seem to stick out like a sore thumb? You ever struggle just trying to fit into places and spaces and sometimes you felt all alone? Am I the only one? Sometimes I walk into a place, I'm like, man, it feels lonely up in here. I feel different. And God says, you are different. Listen, why would the world ever come to the church if when they get here, they're only going to find more of themselves? If you're going to make a difference, you got to be different. Leaders step up and lead. And this, this prophet speaks to the king first. And then he spoke to all the people. He says, listen. Now, what was part of King Asa's reforms? You know what? There was a return to God's word. There was a priority that was put on the word of God. You see, Asa's dad neglected biblical commands. I said it earlier. When you kick God out, you invite confusion in. If you want to kick confusion out, you got to put God back at the center. That's why we do the one-year Bible. I know many of you, you picked up one-year Bibles last week. and Man, we made a commitment. We're going to spend 15 minutes a day, every day, just in the Word of God. I want to encourage you, if you don't have a consistent time in the, in the Word, start today. Uh, build habits 
And January is when we're all trying to do this, right? You ever notice how motivated everybody is in January? You know, motivation will help you start things, but habits will help you sustain things. So start today while the motivation is there. Man, get in this book. I do have some real concerns about the modern church movement today. And I'm not here to, to, to throw shade on the church, but I, I do pray that as believers that we are discipled by this book. My fear is that many of us have been discipled by the media that we've chosen to listen to. Oh, you're not hearing me today. Hey, I'm smiling. I'm saying I'm not angry. I'm not the angry street preacher trying to give you the finger of doom. I'm not saying that at all. I love the house of God, and I challenge you to be discipled by the word of God. Don't interpret life's circumstances through media. Interpret it through this book. Let's be discipled by the B-I-B-L-E more than TikTok, FaceTime, MSNBC, Fox News. Come on, can I just go there? You see, we interpret life events through what media tells us. And unfortunately, we're discipled more by the media than we are by the scriptures. Man, when something happens in our community, we need to go to the book. We need a little vitamin B, I, B, L, E. Yes, that's the book for me. Don't let a news correspondent or some social media influencer shape how you think the world is supposed to be. It's what God says. And if God designed it, then he defines it. Come on, somebody. Uh, Lord, we're going to be people of the book. M my concern is this. If you're not convinced in the authority of Scripture, you're going to be a slave to whatever sounds good. And there's a lot of things out there that sound good, but they're not God. You see, when Asa came in, he prioritized not just the Word of God, but he prioritized prayer. He prioritized prayer. When you pray, you're raising the spiritual temperature of the church. I'm going to tell you this. You cannot have revival apart from prayer. You can't. We want a move of God, but the ingredients of revival require that we add in a double dose of seeking God's face. So, my guy, I don't know how to pray. Listen, keep it simple. It's not complicated. Somebody say, keep it simple. Say, keep it honest. Say, keep it going. If you can just apply those three things, keep it simple, keep it honest, and keep it going, you'll have communion and fellowship with God things begin to happen when God's people pray. Prayer moves the hands that move the world. How many of you need the hand of God to move some things in your life? Well, when God's people begin to pray, the atmosphere changes. The temperature, the spiritual temperature of the church, it rises. Man, there's, there's something electric. There's something dynamic. There's something powerful when the people of God begin to pray. One of the testimonies came in uh, this week of how a, a guy got connected to the church. He said this. He said, my grandmother would pretend to be sick, so I would drive her to church on Sundays since she was 89 years old. But quickly, I started catching on three Sundays in that she was only sick on Sundays but could drive all the other days of the week. <laughs> Come on, everybody say, God bless. God bless. Grandma. Grandma. How many know grandma put up some prayers for that young man? And she was determined to get that young man in church because she knew that if she could get him positioned, if she could get him where he's supposed to be, then that blessing that God had promised for her posterity, not just her children, but her grandkids, would be there for him. And guess what? That young man is now in Healing Place College. Come on, somebody. Put your hands together. Somebody say, Dark times. Say, leaders, step up. Now, look at what it says in verse 8. When Asa heard this message from Azariah the prophet, he took courage, and he did two things. Watch what he does here. He removed all the detestable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin, and in the towns that he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which stood in front of the entry room of the Lord's temple. Notice what two things Asa did. 
when he received the prophetic word of the Lord, the king was challenged to step up and lead. The Bible says he removed some things and he repaired some things. Somebody say remove. Say repair. There are certain things when God begins to move in somebody's life, when he begins to talk to you, there are certain things that he will say you need to eliminate. And then there are certain things he'll say you need to elevate. Come on, are you with me? Let me ask you this. What is God telling you to eliminate? And what is God telling you to elevate? you got to eliminate things that aren't bearing fruit in your life. Some of you, if you want a different 2023, you're going to have to prune some things out of your life that aren't bearing any fruit. It's occupying space. It's taking a whole lot of time and energy. But God's saying, no, 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 that's distracting you from my best. Some of you may, you may need to prune some relationships. Holding on to old things. Listen, when you go back to old friends, you go back to old sins. God may be saying, hey, listen, that season is done. What, what was happening here when King Asa gets the word of the Lord? He says, wait, that's an idol. That's an idol. We got to remove that. that. That's not God. He started to subtract everything that wasn't building the life of God within the people. And some of us need to take some inventory and do the, do the same thing. You know, you, you, you need to add and you need to subtract. You, you, my, my mom would say this. There are four kinds of people in this world. Those who add, those who subtract, those who multiply, and those who divide. And she'd say, find those who add and multiply the goodness of God in your life and stay away from those who subtract and divide. There's a pruning. There's a removal. There's some things we need to eliminate. Idols, idolatry. It's amazing in dark times how you can discover what your idols really are. Sometimes we read about idols in the Bible, and in my mind, I get like a picture of a piece of wood, a rock, there's some sort of relic, and there's people just bowing down. Listen, the idols of today may not be a figure. It may be money. It may be power. It may be fame. It may be pleasure. It may be entertainment. You see, an idol is anything that you put above God. Anything you have to have to be happy other than Jesus is something that the devil can leverage against you. I need this to be happy. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with entertainment, pleasure. Man, there's nothing wrong with money. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. There's a difference. Anything that's elevated above God in our lives is an idol. And God says, I want to strip those things from you. You know, God's not going to share any space in your heart that belongs to him. He says, I am the Lord God. You will have no other gods before me. And what did he do? He began to re repair the altar. He repaired. Not only did he eliminate the idols, but he elevated the presence of God. That's one of the things I love about this church. In a few moments, we're going to wrap up our time together. But I love the fact that we create time in our corporate worship to invite people forward to pray. You know, we give you a chance to respond to what God is saying to you because it's at the place of the altar that God meets us. It's where we confess. It's where we, re we receive grace and mercy. It's where his power and his strength steps into our weakness and gives us what we need to walk in victory. I'm glad that as a church, especially of this size, that we don't just send people out, but we call people forward, and we say, step into all that God has for you. Come on, somebody say remove. remove. Say repair. I want to ask the band to come up. Let me finish this. this verse 9, the Bible says this. Then Asa called together all the people of Judah and Benjamin, along with the people of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, who had settled among them. Now listen to this. This is cool. For many from Israel had moved to Judah during Asa's reign when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. Here's the last thought I want to give you. We understand there are, there, are, there are dark times, but as leaders, we step up. We prioritize his presence. Man, we get in his word. Man, God, we, he helps us to eliminate things that don't belong, to elevate things that do. Then the Bible says this. God does God things. 
God does what only he can do. Not what you and I can engineer or manufacture, but he does the supernatural among us. The scripture says that during Asa's reign, people from Israel, they moved down to Judah. Why? Because they heard that God was with Asa. Now here, check this out. Here's the vision that I had when I read this. I had this vision of people. Y'all going to think I'm crazy. Well, I kind of am. <laughs> How many know we all have our own brand of crazy? You do too. Don't act all normal and sane. I know you, you got your touch too. Here's what I, I envisioned in my mind. I said, Lord, I can just see people moving from all over the United States to get to Baton Rouge. Because why? The Spirit of God is so alive at HPC that people say, you know what? I got to leave Wisconsin. I, I got to leave Vermont. I got to leave Idaho. I don't know why you're living in those places anyway. Y'all need to be down here. Now listen, you can go, if you Google, if you Google top 10 places to live based on, you know, income, job market, schools, safety, activity, beauty, I'm not sure you're going to find Baton, Baton Rouge on the, on the top 10. You may not, okay? I don't know. Maybe some of you, you get out there, you surprise me. It may be out there. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Maybe the not so top 10, but, but I, I don't know if you'll find Baton Rouge as one of those places. But what if there was such an outpouring of God's Spirit right here in South Louisiana that people would say, I got to get down there. You know what? I told you I was born and raised in Missouri, but guess what? My dad moved us to Baton Rouge back in the late 80s. You know why? One reason and one reason only, because the Spirit of God was being poured out here back in 87 and 88. There was a genuine move of God in Baton Rouge. And my dad said, I want my children to experience the power and presence of God. You know, through the internet, we're able to take what's happening here and spread it all over the world. One story, there's a precious lady from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Her name is Heather. Heather was introduced to HPC through a friend who's at LCIW. Check this out. This is how God's connecting these dots. Our ministry at LCIW is being able to influence some of these precious ladies that worship with us every week. Well, this lady at LCIW, she kept in contact with her friend Heather in Green Bay and said, Heather, I know you've had a hard life, but I found a place and God is bringing healing to me. I think he could help you too. So Heather begins to watch us from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Walk through incredibly difficult circumstances. God begins to to heal her from the inside out. She feels this awakening, a personal revival happening inside of her. She builds a connection with our online campus pastor, Pastor Rob Grow. She said, Rob, listen, I feel like the Lord is telling me to take a step of faith. I need to be water baptized. And she said, I don't want to be baptized in Green Bay. I want to be baptized in Baton Rouge with my spiritual family. So Heather came down at the end of last year because she wanted to be baptized with her family here and take a public profession of faith. And she was so excited to worship with us. And now she says, I have found a space and a place. You see, God's trying to position some people. And I believe that when God pours out his spirit, he says, I will draw all men and women unto myself, young and old, rich and poor. It doesn't matter your background, your ethnicity, your income, your education. When Jesus is lifted up, he draws people unto himself. Do you receive that today? Come on, put your hands together.